Sidra Psycho, got a fuel the machine here. A little haterade for the uh, live session. Good times. What I love most about these sessions is opening up for questions and getting a chance to engage with leaders to talk about a specific challenge that they think, a lot of times they think their challenge is unique. And so many people have very similar challenges, even in, in vastly different industries uh, across continents around the globe. So pretty exciting to be able to talk to so many leaders uh, from around the world and uh, looking forward to these live sessions. That's what I love most about them. Yep, sitting here, uh, we're getting ready to do a live session for the Academy, Extreme Ownership Academy online. We're getting ready to do a live session. This is something that we do all the time, talking to talking to leaders at every level, really. And when you join the Academy, you're gonna see you have people that are frontline leaders, you're gonna have people that are frontline, and you've got people that are CEOs and board members, it's everybody. Military members, first responders, just, just every industry. And we do these sessions in order to share the lessons that we learned, hopefully prevent people from making mistakes that we made so they can lead in their life, lead themselves, lead their team, lead their family. That's what we're doing. We made a bunch of improvements to the academy. This is the way we get the word out. You know, our mission at Echelon Front is to teach as many people as we can the leadership lessons that we learned. The best way to make that happen is through virtual training. So we've invested a bunch into making this virtual training as good as it can possibly be. We're gonna to continue to improve it, but that's what we're doing. Getting ready to go live. We do this about once a week. We'll, we'll reach out and we'll, we'll do sessions with members of the academy. That's what we're doing today. This one's open to the public. So give everyone sort of a glimpse into what we offer here and what they can take away from it. That's what we're doing. Getting ready to get it. Thanks for coming, everybody. And, and just so you know what's going on, this is, this is the Extreme Ownership Academy. We do calls like this once a week, maybe twice a week sometimes, but we do at least one of these calls a week on the academy where we answer questions, we go over topics, we talk about things that we're going through, we discuss things with, with people that are members of the academy, and it's a really cool platform to, to utilize. And then, of course, on the Extreme Ownership Academy, there's a bunch of courses that you can take. We got a couple new courses that are on there right now that, that we just released, and they're, they're free. We just want to get this knowledge out there. That's the mission that we have at Echelon Front, is to teach the lessons that we learned to as many people as we can. The lessons that we learned in combat, the lessons that we've now been applying in the civilian world and the business world for, I don't know, a decade or something like that. And there, and we've seen so many different companies apply these things. We know that they work and we're just trying to teach them to as many people as we can. So that's why we're here. That's our mission. That's what we're doing. This virtual platform is definitely the best way to spread the word. So we're trying to make this available to as many people as possible. With that, I'm going to jump into just a couple notes. You know, we, 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 the topic for today was how to be successful in the new year. And, and that's one of those topics. It kind of reminded me of the topic that I talked about on my Instagram on Monday or, or on New Year's Day, which was the new year, new me, and how everyone runs around saying new year, new me. And I said, hey, it's not true. You don't get a new me. You got what you got. And there's a similar theme when I start thinking about how to be successful in 2023. Anyone that knows anything about me, anyone that knows anything about us at Echelon Front, you already know what the answer to this question is. How do you, how do you become successful? Well, take ownership of what's going on in your world and then implement the four laws of combat leadership. That, that's how you become successful. Cover, move, simple, prioritize, and execute, decentrally, decentralized command. That's what you need to do. Those are the methodologies for achieving success. That's what we utilized on the battlefield. That's what we do in our business. That's, that's, that's how we win at life, at, at, with our family, with our health, with our finances. It's those fundamental principles. So cover and move, which is teamwork, working together, building a team, whether it's a team at work, whether it's a, your family, whether it's a group of people that you pursue fitness goals with, Cover move is about building the team and, and supporting each other. Keeping things simple, what's our mission? And what's the simplest course of action to execute that mission? And then prioritize and execute, which means you can't do too many things at once. Don't be ADHD trying to do 58 different things at the same time. It won't work. You need to focus your efforts. And then finally, decentralized command, which means everybody leads. You've got you've to come up with what your game plan is and you've got to let people execute. And, and sometimes you might be thinking, well, Jock was talking about a business. No, I'm talking about 
getting your kids to make their own peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That's decentralized command. So it applies to everything. And make sure that everybody on the team understands why they're doing what they're doing. And then make sure that everyone on the team understands why we are doing what we are doing. So those are the, the, the core principles that we teach. And we've seen those principles fix SEAL platoons. We've seen those principles turn around scores of businesses and teams. We've watched these principles fix all kinds of companies and organizations. So if you wanna learn about those fundamental principles, of course, obviously we've written about them in the books. We've got the online academy. We've got courses about each one of those. But I wanna talk a little bit more specifically, get a little bit more granular on a personal level on how to win in 2023. And I'm gonna address something. I'm gonna use a phrase that I used on the podcast a couple weeks ago. We were talking about making things happen, and, and what I said was that dreams die in execution. Dreams die in execution. And I've seen this over and over and over again throughout my life. People have great ideas. People have great visions. People have solid concept of operations and then nothing. Nothing ever comes of it. Look, other than talking, maybe some, maybe some planning, maybe a diagram, maybe they sketch out a diagram, maybe a few emails, maybe some conversations. I know interestingly, talking with Andrew Huberman about this stuff, there's a, a, a part of your brain that when you talk about doing something cool, you actually get a dopamine satisfaction from it. If I just talk about working out, I can feel good about it. Like, oh, I'm, go I'm gonna do a good workout tomorrow. That actually is enough dopamine to get me through. Don't even need to work out. You start thinking, oh, I'm gonna write a book. Just talking about, hey, JP, I'm gonna write a new book. It's gonna be awesome. It makes me feel good. J JP goes cool, he gives me some great feedback. I didn't even have to write anything. Didn't even have to do anything, got free dopamine. So that trips people up. So they have these ideas, they have these conversations, but nothing ever actually happens, and that's where the dream dies. And a great idea without execution is completely and utterly worthless. So, so what we have to do is we have to execute. That's what we have to do. We have to execute. And you know, this reminded me, and I see Dave Burks on the, on the call as well, this reminds me of this comparison that Dave and I did with the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, and act. And something that I had had counseled a young Lieutenant Seth Stone about. Lieutenant Seth Stone was Leif's counterpart in Tasking to Bruiser. He was the Delta Platoon commander. And we were out in the desert and we were doing vehicle immediate action drills in our Humvees, which means you're in your Humvee and you're patrolling through the desert. And then we've got targets that pop up. And then with all these four or five different Humvees that you have, you have to coordinate your response. And so when the targets pop up, everyone starts shooting at these targets and it's chaos. And I was riding in the vehicle. I was, I was Seth's boss at the time. And I'm riding in the vehicle to kind of observe how he's doing. And every time the shooting would start, Seth would just like lock up and freeze and not do anything, not make a call. So we got done with one of those iterations and I took a Sharpie magic marker and I wrote in the, on the window in front of him, hey, I said, hey, listen, man, next time the shooting starts, next time you hear bullets start flying out of the guns, I want you to do this. And I wrote one, relax, two, look around, three, make a call. Boom. And we go out on the next iteration and I'm sitting behind Seth and the machine gun fire starts and I'm watching him and he takes a breath and I can see he's relaxed and I see him turn his head and look around and he gets on the radio and he makes a call. But the interesting thing was, is I didn't say execute. And the reason I didn't say execute, the reason I didn't put step number four is to execute was because Seth had a good platoon. 
Seth had a good platoon. Seth had J JP Dinell was in his platoon. He's on here today. You probably are going to hear from him at some point. But if you tell JP to do something, and JP's a young enlisted SEAL, he's going to execute. You don't need to. You don't need to ask him twice. You don't need to beg him. His platoon wasn't having any trouble executing because they were a squared away SEAL platoon. They were chomping at the bit to execute. They just needed to hear what the call was. But for many people, on an individual level, the hard part that they actually need to focus on is the execution part. They procrastinate for a minute, which becomes an hour, which becomes a day, which becomes a week, which becomes a month, which becomes a year, which becomes decades. And that might seem far-fetched, I guarantee, how many people are on this call right now? A thousand people that are just on the Zoom call. I think we got 5,000 total. I guarantee that there are people on this call that have been sitting on an idea for more than a decade. I guarantee it. Sitting on a dream for over 10 years. And that's horrible. That's where dreams die. That's where ideas die. That's where projects die. So... How do you go about overcoming this? How do you actually go about overcoming this? And what you do is you take action. And listen, the action doesn't need to be huge. You don't, you, you, you probably heard me say this, I write a thousand words a day. When I gotta write a book, I write a thousand words a day. I don't care if I write seven words in an hour, I write seven words, okay, at least I tried. And the next day I'll, I'll write more. But to do nothing, to write zero words, the difference between zero words and seven words is infinite. So you have to take some kind of action. This is what's cool. Right now we're running the deaf reset. And one of the things on the deaf reset is to write down the top three things you need to do. And then you go do those three things. That's why we have that in there. And you know, I, I, I had this conversation with Jordan Peterson, like, imagine if you do what you're supposed, imagine if you wrote down the three things you need to do tomorrow, and then tomorrow you woke up and you did them. And then imagine if you did that for a week, and then imagine if you did that for a year, and then imagine if you did that for five years, where would you be in life? Totally different place. But that hardest step is that first step to break the gravitational pull Break the gravitational pull of stagnation. So, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take action. Now, this is also important. Equally important is that when you execute, you have to pay attention to the feedback loop. You have to pay attention. When you take action, you have to pay attention to the feedback that you then get. Is... The action that you took, is it having the desired effect that you want? And this seems so obvious. It seems so obvious to say, okay, I took this action. I'm getting positive feedback. I should do it more. That's great. Sometimes we take action. We don't get the feedback that we want. We realize maybe we're not on the right path. And instead of adjusting, we keep trying the same plan. We keep trying the same maneuver. We keep trying the same tactic, even though it's not working. And by the way, that's something that causes a lack of execution. Because people think when they execute that whatever they do is written in stone. And it's not. Nothing's written in stone. Well, just about nothing is written in stone. If, you, if you're flexible, if you know you can change course, if you know you can adjust direction, if you know you can adapt to a shifting marketplace or a, a new battlefield scenario... If you know, if you go in with an open mind and you know you can change your mind and make adjustments, then that will make it easier for you to execute. And that's why we talk about utilizing the iterative decision-making process, making small decisions, taking small actions, execute those actions swiftly, and then adjust rapidly and repeat. And that's, that's, how, that's how you move forward. That's how you move forward. And these are the principles of how you move forward. And these are the principles of how you win. Take ownership. 
cover move, simple, prioritize and execute, decentralize command, take action, listen to the feedback. Stay humble because because your ideas are not going to be perfect. They're not going to be perfect. I've had good ideas. I've had bad ideas. I've never had a perfect idea ever. That's okay. What do you do? Adjust, reattack, repeat. Adjust, reattack, repeat. That's how you win. That's how you win in 2023, and that's how you win every time, every place in life. And with that, Leif, I don't know if you got any additional uh, comments there, but we can jump into some uh, some Q and A. It's definitely one that resonates with me, that quote, you know, the dreams die between uh, decide and act in the OODA loop or, or in the execute piece. Um, Cause I come up with a lot of great ideas, you know, and then, and then those ideas get pushed off or it takes, it takes uh, a long time. And I think, uh, you know, to, to get to something. And I think what you have to do is take extreme ownership, something that JP uh, has said that resonates with me. If it, Cause oftentimes, right, we say, well, we don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. I didn't have time to get to this. It's not that you don't have time for it, it's that you didn't make it a priority. And if you if you take that approach and you take extreme ownership of making the things a priority that are gonna move you further along down the road on the big strategic initiatives that are gonna impact your life or take you in a different direction, um, you know, for, for the better, uh, then then you will make those things a priority and you'll actually get them done and, uh, and you'll be able to execute. It looks like we got some hands raised. I'm tempted to just to jump into some hands raised. So Steve Lyell, what do you got? Jamie's laughing because I'm disobeying her her protocol. What do you got, Steve? Violating Yo, SOPs. Yep. What do you got, Joker Steve? Willink. What's up, man? Hey, I'm just shooting in from uh, Manawatu Fielding, New Zealand. Outstanding. So a huge fan of all your work. I'm currently reading Extreme Ownership for the first time. And um, it's, yeah, it's fueling me, man. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a year into jiu-jitsu. I'm thriving in it. And um, it's just ticking so many boxes. And I feel every day more inspired to, yeah, take ownership and uh, pave the way forward. So thank you for your, um, yeah, thank you for your work. Right on, man. Appreciate it. Hey, just a question. Um, how vital is it to first understand what our nature is before making plans? What our, and just to be a little more specific in that, how vital is it to understand our psychophysical nature? Because often we make plans, but they're not personalized or relevant to what our true nature actually is. Can you speak to that? Yes. You have to account for what your nature is. And if you're not accounting for what your nature is, you're going to make, you're going to put yourself in scenarios where things aren't going to be as good as you want them to be. Now, I'm going to say this too. Your nature is not a curse that you're stuck with. It's something that you have to contend with, but it's not something that you go, oh, well, I was never good at this. Therefore, I'm not going to attempt, but to look at your world and say, oh, you know what? This isn't my strength. I'm pretty good at this thing. I should focus on this thing and maybe get someone on my team that's good at that type of that that skill set that I lack. So always taking nature into account, your own nature, other people's nature, taking that into account is absolutely critical. You know, uh, we have Jamie Cochran that works. She's the, she's the chief operating officer. She's on here um, again. She was the one that was laughing as soon as I departed from the standard operating procedure that we have, but. You know, she has skill sets that I don't have, right? She's really good. She, she, will, she will catch things that I wouldn't catch. Mm -hmm. So if I was to say, you know what? I'm just going to run this whole company myself and I'll just, I'll handle all the details. Jamie's probably laughing even harder now because she knows if it was up to me to run a bunch of details, I would, I would be wasting my time. There's no point in it. So yes, account for nature but don't think of nature as a curse. Think of it as a, a blessing. What are you good at? Let's focus on those things and get somebody on the team to cover on some areas where you're weak. Make sense, man? Yeah, cover and move. <laughs> yes, indeed. 
All right, Mike V, I'll answer your question. And then I don't know if Jamie or Leif is scanning through the uh, Stand by for the chat. They can jump in with the questions. Let's get to, let's go with Mike V. What do you got? What's your question? Hey, what's up? Well, first I want to appreciate everyone on the echelon team for everything you guys do. It's not just as you guys explained that it's about the team. And I can see, especially after the training with the barriers, when I saw Jamie, how she used the principles with her children of the 12 year old and the three year old. So with that, it kind of reminded me of a, a piece of advice I received as a teenager. And it was from a high school counselor who said, Mike, you're in such a rush to grow up, but you don't realize that adults are just grown up teenagers. And I think that's why it's very frustrating for you, Jacko, or for Leith, or for anyone in the National where leadership is key and the principles are so basic, but it's the human nature, going back to what Steve is, is saying, that stops us because we're all just grown up teenagers. So my question is, when was the last time that you felt like a grown up teen where you had to kick yourself in the ass to say, oh, I, I, need, a, I need to work on this? And what was your mindset? I think really quickly about Jacko, we talked about in a clip about building the shelf in your jujitsu gym. And that shelf bothered you so much, but you decided, oh, I, 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 ah, it's a little bit of time. And then you started calculating. I finally did it. And I realized how much time I wasted because we're all grown up teenagers, even the gods that we look up to, because at the end of the day, we're all human beings. Well, definitely no gods on here. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, I have two, I have a locker in my, in my gym and for years, I actually have two lockers and one of them had a shelf in it, the other one didn't have a shelf. And the one without a shelf just had all this crap piled up in there, it was hard to get in and out of. Every time I needed something, it took me an extra three minutes to get in there and find it. And I lived like this for years. And I'm talking like three years, maybe even four years, I lived like this. And I would avoid that thing. And then finally one day, I think I was, my, my, my daughter wanted to train jujitsu, but she was teaching a class. And she goes, will you train with me tonight? And she, I said, when's your class over? She said, a half an hour. I said, okay, it took me 15 minutes to go in there, build that new shelf, have everything squared away, have everything clean. I took action that I had procrastinated on. And then that, I had like a legitimate sense of euphoric relief when I was done, which is crazy to think about. Why? Because I had overcome this ridiculous, and I don't procrastinate much. So for me to procrastinate something like that is a, uh, is, is a lesson that you're saying, right? We, we can be stupid, we can act like teenagers. And what I started this whole thing off with, buck up, got an issue, get it, get it solved, take action. And with that, uh, Jamie Leif, what do we got in the, what do we got in the chat room? Yeah, I, I got, uh, got a first question from Scott here. I was just gonna say, you know, to answer from Mike there, I think the the nature of extreme ownership is recognized. It's it's humbling but liberating. It, it's it's humbling to know that it's all your fault, uh, but it's liberating to know that everybody makes mistakes and no one has all the answers. And all you got to do is take ownership uh, of of something that you screwed up or some place you need to improve, and implement a solution. And uh, and that's all that's all that's required. So uh, it is definitely liberating when you think about it from that perspective. Scott Sib Sibsnuski, uh, caveman Scott, at one after. I have someone interested in investing in my business. What criteria would you use to determine if it's a good fit? What expectations would you develop? What questions should I ask? Where are you hey. at, Scott? What's up, Scott? Hey, how are you doing? So you got an you investor. Think? And for those of you that don't know, we have background because Scott's a member of the Academy. We talk we talk once a week, so we're, we're constantly solving problems. And he's grown his company a bunch in the past year and is doing outstanding and obviously he's doing outstanding because he got pe he's got people that want to put money in they want to throw money at you scott i know it's yeah, rough it's ironic i was thinking uh a little over a year ago i'm asking you how to start a business and then through last year now i'm uh, i met a guy right after the ftx and then a three-hour conversation we just really built a relationship and he's like i want to be how can I be part of your business? And uh, we've had several conversations and he's a, he's an owner developer. He's more of a customer type and he has 35 years of experience in developing. And if anybody can, can guide me through the downfalls of being a plumbing contractor and, and being that crystal ball, it's him not only has influenced his contacts and his company, but just in the growth of our business overall. And so we're in a discussion now and just, 
just trying to understand like what's the good fit what questions am i missing yep so just like what i kind of led this thing off with this is a classic case where taking iterative steps to to continue to grow this relationship and at the same time make some make some kind of solid steps that are actually unifying you two so maybe what you do out of the gate is you say hey you know uh fred what i want to do is i want to put together a board of directors and i'd like you to be the first board member to come on board and you know maybe you even say hey you know i'd like to pay you a little bit of money you know maybe you offer him i mean a, a very small amount of money to be one of your board of directors and now he's giving you that advice and then you say, and over time, I'd like to, you know, do some kind of partnership with you. And, you know, the first step in the partnership might be, hey, you know, after he's on the board for six months and everything's going great, he still is a great guy. He's giving you all this information and he's helping you build the business. You say, you've been so helpful to me. Like, I would like to bring you on as a, I want to, I want to get more formal and bring you join forces as a partner. What does that look like? And then you got to go through the, through the calculations of what's the value of the business and how much do you want to sell to him and how much control do you want to keep, which by the way, you want to keep a lot and, and go through those and you just build this over time. But I would start off by with, with an iterative step where we're bringing him on, where we can utilize his advice, where we can grow, we can get to know each other better. And that's something you could do. You could do that tomorrow. Right? You do that tomorrow. You say once a month, we're going to have a board meeting. You're going to present the numbers to them and show them how we're doing. And, and that kind of thing is, is how you, you grow a relationship and you do it around work. Does that make sense, Scott? Yeah, and that's really what um, he's been a part of some of our weekly meetings and just given advisement to our team. And he already um, he has an opportunity in Arizona. I was there for Christmas and he already set up a meeting. So, and it was funny, we were talking this morning. And he's like, he really appreciated me kind of pushing this subject of what this relationship is going to look like. Because quite frankly, he's already acting like he's part of the business. He talks like that. But, you know, I want to I want to protect both of us and I want him to take advantage of whatever he brings to us. So it's just we are taking those steps. And, um, you know, one thing I've learned through last year was just taking things slow. And and that's that's really what we're going to. Think about the next six months and what that looks like. Let me just let me just throw this out there. You said you learned taking things slow. And you gotta remember the beauty of iterative decisions is that they don't have to be slow. The beauty is that you can make I did, you can do this tomorrow. You can form a board tomorrow. And you can execute and say, hey, I want you to be part of the board. Boom, I want to pay you ten thousand dollars a year as like a as like a, a, a show of good faith that I really appreciate what you're doing and boom. It's not about doing things slowly. It's about doing things quickly, rapidly, and then making adjustments. And then the adjustments can be, man, this guy could turn out to be maybe not everyone that everything that you thought he was. And you look up and you go, you know what? I'm, <laughs> I'm dissolving the board. Bye Fred, you know, who knows? But if things go in the positive direction, you can take the next step. You can take the next step. So don't confuse iterative decision making with being slow. It's actually moving fast. It's being decisive, but it's making small decisions and making adjustments. All right. Right on. What else we got in there, Leif? What else we got in there, Leif? Appreciate it, Scott. We got uh, a three after from uh, Kevin Hess. Good morning, EF team. How should a person train to remain calm in stressful situations? Where are you at, Kevin? Right here. Kevin, what do you do for a living? I'm in engineering. So what kind of stressful situations do you foresee yourself being in? Uh, well, just you know, with the team presenting to uh, executive leadership, you know, that could be stressful for them. And so it's really about how to prepare them uh, to, to respond to those situations calmly. And then, you know, just everyday stressors of life, right? Yep. Uh, there's stressful situations and, and um, being able to respond calmly is better than to freak out and then overdo it. Yes, indeed. The, so what we're talking about here, Kevin, is we're talking about the skill 
of detaching from the chaos that's going on, detaching from the mayhem that's happening. The way that we trained young SEAL leaders to do this was to put them in chaotic situations. Not totally overwhelm them, although sometimes we would totally overwhelm them just that, so that they could see the outcome of panic. But we would put them in high pressure situations where if they started to get excited, get overwhelmed, start yelling, everything would fall apart. So in order to train people for stressful situations, we would put people in stressful situations. Now, what does this mean for you? You're an engineering, you're running an engineering team, you have to do presentations. It is very easy to do a rehearsal with your team and you, you sit there and ask them really hard questions. Ask them questions that don't make any sense. Maybe even yell at them when they're trying to give their presentation. Hey, that doesn't make any sense. You're role playing worst case scenarios that they might face during a presentation. I know that at Echelon Front we do this. Someone, you know, before someone, before an instructor goes out and presents, we'll bring them in front of what we call a murder board and we'll ask really hard questions. Questions that maybe there's no right answer to, but they're just gonna emotionally trigger on both sides. So that everyone on the team goes, oh, I know what's happening right now. I'm getting asked a question that's gonna make me look bad. And if I take the bait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm an idiot here. So here's what I'm gonna do instead. I'm gonna take a step back, I'm gonna detach, I'm gonna take a breath, and then I'm gonna respond in an according way. So if you want to get people used to being in pressure situations, the best thing to do is put them in pressure situations. And again, we don't want to smash their confidence. If you smash someone's confidence, that's not going to help them. You also don't want to make them overconfident by throwing them softballs that are super easy, but you want to give them that 80% pressure where it's hard for them and they learn from it. Does that make sense, Kevin? Yes, it does. Thanks. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, everyone here, you know, between Dave as a Top Gun instructor, between, you know, JP as a as a CQC and a close quarters combat instructor, and Leif and I running training for the SEALs, we've all done a bunch of, of getting people used to stressful situations. So that's what we do. We put people under stress and eventually they learn to deal with it. And you know, I just covered this, I was on Andrew Huberman's podcast and I covered a bunch of these things. I know we covered on the Academy as well. Some of the more advanced courses on the Academy, I go over exact methodologies of protocols for when the stress level is high and how to deal with those things. Those are all courses you can take right in the Academy. Great, thank you both for what you do. Yeah, right on. Thanks Kevin, great question. No growth in the comfort zone. Got to people out, put people outside their comfort zone. We got a question from, uh, we'll take uh, take a question from YouTube here. And I think Jamie's got got some more for us. Um, but Brian asks, how do I best tell a friend, coworker, I'm choosing to better myself by not drinking? They always talk me out of being disciplined as I need to develop discipline. Any thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, this is a sad, uh, a sad reality is that misery enjoys company. And again, this is the, the old parable of the crabs in the bucket. You're a crab that's trying to crawl out of the bucket. And as you get to the top of the bucket, the other crabs grab you and pull you back down to the bucket. I know I've told this story before about Seth Stone. Seth Stone was wanting to go to Princeton University. There was a, a relatively unknown program from the Navy to go from the Navy and go to Princeton University. And he wanted to try for this program and a bunch of other officers when he told them said oh you shouldn't do that that's gonna hurt your career and, and he said that to me I said what do you mean how is it gonna hurt your career to be to have a, a degree in policy from Princeton University tell me how that's gonna hurt your career but it was other crabs that were trying to pull them down so when people in your life are trying to encourage you to do things that are that we know are not good for you especially if you admittedly are saying, hey, I've got issues and I know I shouldn't be drinking and your friends are encouraging you to drink, they're trying to keep you in that bucket. They're trying to keep you down. And it, look, you don't have to be mad at them. You just have to recognize what's happening. And then you have to move forward. And if you 
have crabs that are continually yanking at your legs and trying to drag you back down, eventually you'll realize that maybe you don't want to be with those crabs anymore. You want to find some seagulls that have wings that are going to pull you out of this place and help you and support you. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We're trying to find people and hang around with people that want to lift us up rather than people that are looking to drag us down. And, and I'm going to tell you, it's, it's difficult to find those people. It, we all have egos. We all have envy. We all have, we all have jealousy. And sometimes, you know, JP's like doing super hard workout and I'm over there thinking, man, JP's doing, doing better than me. And maybe I want to encourage JP not to work out so hard. Right? Like, okay. Why is that? What kind of a, what kind of a loser would I be if I don't want my friends to get stronger? That's, that's crazy. So if you run into these kind of people, just, just recognize, look, you don't have to hate, hate everybody. You'll end up being, you'll end up uh, being mad all the time. But just understand what people are doing. Understand what they're going through. I feel for, you know, JP would feel sorry for me. If I was trying to convince JP not to work out, he would feel sorry for me. Because he'd realize, oh, Jocko feels weak. And I feel sorry for him. That's what would happen. So, there you go. TJ O'Neillia, what do you got? You got a question? I saw your hand up earlier. Yeah, Jocko, I think I saw it. I typed it in and it got answered, but... I was wondering at what point iterative, iterative decision making could seem like a lack of continuity. Yeah, so where it can see, seem like a lack of continuity is when you haven't thought through what's even happening. And there's also a trouble that we can run into where that we have to be careful of is I get feedback and the feedback that I get isn't exactly what I want, so I just surrender. Right? So this is the dichotomy of leadership. You know, Leif and I wrote a book called The Dichotomy of Leadership. If you take anything to an extreme, it's going to be negative. That's actually true with iterative decision making. Because if I say, okay, listen up, Echelon Front. From now on, we're going we're gonna to go forward. We're going to... What would be a good thing to use? We're going to We're going to hold an event in South America. Jamie, go check out what we can do in South America. And Jamie comes back to me two days later and she said, you know, I looked at the venues down there and I didn't see any that really looked good for us. And I went, okay, well, forget it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I could just say, okay, well, forget it. In fact, when we did the very first mustard echelon front, it was like, I think we could do something. And you know, the first feedback was like, well, we don't have much time. We don't have much time to get it ready and sell tickets and all that. And the, I could have taken that and said, well, okay, Jamie went and researched it and now we're just not going to do it. But instead it was like, okay, well, how much time do we have? And how big of a place can we fill? So you're right, TJ. You have to be careful that you don't overreact to the feedback that you're getting. This is a problem. That's why you have to, what you have to do as a leader is you're collecting data. That's what you're doing. You're collecting data. That's how you're making decisions, but through data collection. And if you, just like any decision, if you take one piece of data and you over index on that, it can throw you off, completely off. So when I get data, when Jamie tells me, hey, you know, this client doesn't seem they're worth working with, I just don't say, okay, well, forget them. Tell them we're not working with them. I say, okay, well, what's going on? And Dave worked with them last year. Dave, what do you think? And well, hey, what's the issue? Is that they don't have budget or they don't have enough time? Okay, so it's one piece of data. And what we have to be do as leaders is going back to the earlier question from Kevin, we have to take a step back and detach so that we can see all the data. And we don't over-index on one thing. If we over-index on one thing, it's going to be problematic. That's why being detached is so important. That's why keeping an open mind is so important. That's why listening to the feedback is so important. Yes, you're right, TJ. Can you, can you become indecisive? And actually, the very first academy online that we ever did live i talked about this i talked about how when leaders make a decision that little decision that a leader makes which is no big deal like if if we're supposed to do a a muster in dallas texas and one day i say you know i'd really like to go to to wichita kansas hey it took me one second to make that decision i call up jamie hey jamie you know what we're not going to dallas anymore send us to wick just get us a muster in wichita kansas 
What does that do to Jamie? It took me less than one second to make that decision. Jamie has months of work to undo and redo. So if we're making rapid changes that aren't consistent with our overall plan, it's going to be problematic. Does that make sense, TJ? TJ O'Neillia from, from ONG Construction, one of the first events ever conducted by Echelon Front. There you go. But was it, what, 10 years ago, something like that, TJ? 2012. And still putting the principles into action and an incredible company up there, uh, construction company. By the way, used to be sort of a regional construction company. Are we nationwide now? You bet. <laughs> right on. Salute. Thank you. We got a, got a question from uh, at three after from Jason. Uh, hello, my name is Jason. I'm a manager of a retail company. I've been encountering problems with the owner. His bad temper has caused valuable employees to leave our shop and work for direct competitors. I take ownership in all the shop's failings and my employees have seen my example fall suit. Um, however, the owner likes to find an employee and bully them for months in a battle of attrition to which uh, eventually the employee loses and leaves. Uh, do you have any advice on how to handle a bad employee that happens to, to be the owner? Thanks. Jason, where are you at, Jason? I'm here. I just want to make sure you're not getting reprimanded or bullied right now by your boss. So no, 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 <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> so, so look, in leadership strategy and tactics, I talked about the escalation of counseling with someone that's below you in the chain of command. So, if I'm working with Leif and Leif is he's not finishing his projects on time, I just don't jump down his throat and yell at him. I I say, hey, Leif, you know what's going on? Are you getting the support you need? And he says, well, I could use this. This would help me. And so hopefully he performs better next time. If he doesn't perform ne better next time, I got to escalate that and say, hey, Leif, you got to get this stuff done. Otherwise, I'm going to have to start pulling some leadership away from you. And he says, okay, I'll fix it. Maybe fix it. If he doesn't fix it, maybe I have to actually write him up and say, hey, Leif, look, next time you miss a timeline on this, I'm actually going to have to pull you out of this leadership position. And hopefully he goes, no, you don't need to do that. And he squares himself away if he doesn't. Maybe I have to go ahead and pull him out of that leadership position. Maybe I even eventually have to fire him. That's what I have to do with someone below me in the chain of command. I also might possibly have to do that with someone that's above me in the chain of command. Meaning if you're working for somebody and you've tried the indirect approach, you've, you've escalated, you've talked to them, you've tried to be a buffer between the boss and the employees, and you've tried over and over again, and you're not making progress, at some point, you have to recognize the way you take ownership of the situation is by leaving the situation. Now, listen, that is, that is pretty rare that that actually happens. Most of the time, when we work with companies and we work with individuals that they're running into a situation like this, most of the time, as they form a good relationship with their boss and they gain trust and they listen to what the boss has to say and they treat their boss with respect, over time, the boss starts to listen to them. The relationship is strong and they can steer their boss in the right direction and usually can get things fixed. Occasionally, you have somebody that has uh, what we talked about, first question on this call, has a bad nature right? They formed their personality at a car crash scene, right? They're just, they don't have a good personality. They don't, they're not empathetic. They don't listen. They're arrogant. And when you get someone like that, the, the one type of human being that we say we can't turn into a, a better leader is the one that's arrogant. So if you have someone that's arrogant, they're a bully, they're treating people badly, and you've built that relationship and you've tried to steer them in a, the right direction, there are times where what you do to take ownership is you have to figure out what your exit strategy is going to be. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Some people catch themselves in that almost like a codependent relationship where when taking ownership becomes I'm at fault for everything and therefore I'm not going to leave this bad relationship. Well, sometimes... Just like a codependent relationship, if you got someone that's abusive, the way you take ownership is by leaving. So you got to keep that in mind sometimes. Okay, thank you very much. 
Hey, Jamie, Jeff I know you've got Dave. some questions. Go yeah, ahead. there's as I look through both the YouTube and the, the Zoom chat, there's a lot of questions around influence. There's questions around how do I influence my team to take on board these principles of extreme ownership? How do I influence my team to feel bought into the mission? How do I motivate my team? So there's a lot of questions around this influence question, which I know you have some thoughts on. So can you guys talk to how do you influence your team, whether it's to buy into our principles of extreme ownership or just generally buy into the mission and create those relationships up and down the chain of command? So this is a very similar question that we get along these lines is how do I get people to listen to me? How do I get people to trust me? How do I get people to respect me? And how do I get influence over people? So trust, influence, listen, respect. How do we get these things? How do we make these things happen? And this is a kind of a counterintuitive answer. And the first one is the most counterintuitive. And that is, hey, how do I get someone to listen to me? And the answer is, you listen to them. If you want someone to listen to you, what you do is you close your mouth and you listen to what they have to say. And you're going to see that this relates directly to how do I get someone to trust me? The way I get someone to trust me is I put trust in them. I know when JP tells stories when we first started working together, JP was 20 years old or 21 years old. How did I get him to trust me? I put trust into him. I gave him responsibilities that I trusted him with and he started to trust me. The next one is respect. How do you get someone to respect you? Well, that's easy. You just demand that they respect you. No, actually, we all know that that doesn't work. If you want someone to treat you with respect, you have to treat them with respect. And if you do that, you will start to grow mutual respect for each other. And this gets to Jamie's question, which is how do I get influence over the team? And the answer to that is, and I know this is counterintuitive, you allow the team to influence you. So, if I want to influence what Jamie is thinking about how we conduct uh, an event, the best thing that I can do to get her to be open-minded is to actually allow her to influence me on the way we're conducting the event. And that's the way we're going to go through this. So when you want to influence your team, the best way you can get to have influence with your team is to allow your team to influence you. And this is such small things. And where people get caught up is people get caught up in things that don't matter. People get caught up in things that don't matter. People say, um, you know, we need, I, hey, we need to have this meeting at eight o'clock every morning. And Jamie says, you know, Jonko, if we, where traffic falls, if we could do it at 830, everyone would be a lot easier for, for everyone to be here and they could spend time with their kids in the morning. And no, no, I said eight o'clock. I said eight o'clock. And she says, well, you know, I, Jocko, I was thinking we could even, we'd take lunch. We, 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 everyone would rather come at 8.30 and we would do half an hour less lunch just so we could have that little flexibility. Hey, Jamie, I already told you. Jamie, I said 8 o'clock. Now, when I hold a hard line like that, what does that do? What does that prove to Jamie? It proves to Jamie I don't trust her. It proves it to her I'm not listening to her. It proves that I'm not allowing her to influence me at all. And it's over half an hour. And what's driving that, by the way, just so everyone knows, it's just my ego. It's just my ego driving that. So instead, when Jamie says to me, hey, Jocko, you know, we're talking to the team and everyone's kind of having a hard time getting here right at eight o'clock. Could we bump that meeting back to 8.30? And instead, I, I look at her and I say, hey, Jamie, whatever you think would work best for you and the team. Nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever you think will work great. You, you, tell, you tell me what time you want me to be there. And now what happens? Now, when there's something that I do need to have influence over Jamie on, then Jamie's mind is open. So that's the answer and it applies to everything that we do. If you want to get people to listen to you, listen to them. If you want people to trust you, put trust in them. If you want people to respect you, treat them with respect. And if you want to have influence with people, you have to allow them to influence you. That's the way it works. And Jamie, whatever time you want to do that meeting is fine with me. Let me know. <laughs>
Awesome, Jacko. Uh, there, there's another cool question here that I think you are best suited uh, than maybe anyone on this call to talk to. It was a question by William. And the question was, how do you recommend investing time and energy when you have multiple things that you're trying to manage? Um, and he even called out you specifically with your various businesses and projects and books and all the things that you do. How do you focus on each of these independently without half, as he said, half-assing any of them? Yep. Any, any Again, this this is the opener, right? And this is a question I get asked on a regular basis. I've got a bunch of different things going on. How do I possibly do it? I'll tell you exactly how I do it. Cover and move, simple, prioritize and execute, decentralized command. That's literally what I do. So um, Jamie runs huge events at Echelon Front. They're called the muster. Multi-million dollars worth of revenue. There's all kinds of behind the scenes things happening. There's, there's just an incredible amount of effort that goes into those. And you know what I do for the muster, which we do two or three times a year, you know what I do for those? Nothing. Well, actually, no. I show up, put a microphone on, and walk out on stage and talk. That's what I do. We have, we have factories in Maine, two, two, three factories in Maine, two factories in North Carolina that are making boots and jeans and geese. How is that happening? Is that because I'm down there telling people how to sew? No, we have decentralized command. We have awesome people down there that understand what the mission is that are making those things happen. You know, this whole academy that we have right now, like it was a vision from me and Leif, like, hey, we need to make sure we can train people online. But do you think I wrote the code? I didn't write the code. Did Leif come up with the, what the font we were gonna use? No, we're not doing that. Hey, here's the vision. And the team grabs it and goes and executes. So how do I do this? Well, cover and move, simple, prioritize and execute and decentralized command. These are, are literally a godsend, you know? And we wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do any of the things that I'm doing right now. I wouldn't be able, I'd be able to do zero. Well, no, I'd be able to do one. I'd be able to do like Jocko podcast. That's what I'd be able to do. I'd be sitting there and I'd be getting ready for that and I'd go do Jocko podcast. But everything else that, that we have, Jocko publishing wouldn't be here. Jocko fuel wouldn't be here. Echelon front. I wouldn't be involved with it. So that's what you have to do. And you work with awesome people. You know, JP runs the FTX at, at Echelon front. We, he's running, I don't even know how many he's running, 30, 40 of those a year, Tr full training events with risk management, with different companies all over the country. You know what I do? First of all, I, I hardly even go to most of them. And when I do go to them, I just show up and talk. Dave Burke runs our, our, actually, I think it's something like our four biggest clients at Echelon Front, our four highest revenue for Echelon Front. I think it's four or five companies that provide the biggest contracts for Echelon Front. I've never talked to them. It's Dave Burke. He's running that part of the company. So that's what we're doing. That's how this works. It's there's no secrets here. I'm I'm I don't have I I, uh, I don't have some magic you know a clone or three or four clones that are out there doing all this stuff. No, I just got awesome teams and awesome people, and we work together to accomplish the mission. That's what's happening. Jocko, to add to that, like, I actually now do that at FTXs. Cody and his team literally don't let me do anything. I, there's nothing for me to do. I'll try to do stuff. It pisses them off when I grab the garbage and take it out. Like, they'll have guys grab me and grab the trash from me. Like, I, it's awesome. The laws of combat, doing what you have taught us to do, it's the same thing now when I show up to, to an FTX. Cody and his team are running everything. And, and and I know Jamie will say the same thing about the muster. And I've actually seen Jamie, like, while there's a bunch of things happening at the muster, she's not doing anything. She's just sitting around doing nothing. I know Dave Burke. At one point, Dave Burke told me, oh, you know, my calendar's so full and he's all excited about it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So you have to do everything. That's good decentralized command. And six months later, he's like, hey, I can do whatever I want. The team's running it. So yeah, as you grow and as the people on your team grow, everyone is stepping up. And that way, JP is looking up and out. 
Jamie's looking up and out. Dave's looking up and out. They're not having to look down and in at the FTX or down and in at the muster or down and in at the LDAPs. Everyone's looking up and out. That's what we're doing. Straightforward. I think part of that too is, is the, is accepting that what you're trying to do is become the silent leader where you don't have to do everything. And I think this, people have this idea of the traditional leader where you've got to make all the calls and you're doing everything. Uh, and that's actually not what good leadership looks like. That's what I thought good leadership looked like until, uh, until I worked with Jocko and Tasking a Bruiser. And when he was letting me run with stuff and asking me how I wanted to do things and empower me to step up and lead, I realized that's actually what good leadership looks like and that's what we should all be striving toward. If you want to be in charge of everything, you should try and be in charge of nothing. Now look, when you start off, when Leif and I started Echelon Front, bro, we did everything. I mean, we were booking flights, we were setting up our travel, we did everything ourselves, obviously, because there's no one there. But then as we grew, as soon as we could, we, we gave these responsibilities to other people and then they stepped up, took ownership and made things happen. Jamie started doing that for us. Now Jamie, Jamie doesn't do any of that stuff anymore. I'm not sure what Jamie does anymore. <laughs> but Jamie doesn't do that kind of stuff. She's, she's building business. She's building business. She's out as an instructor. She's out growing the platform. She's not managing travel anymore. So, so that's what we do. That's how it works. And that, my friends, is 11.58. I know that when we run these things, uh, usually weekly we go a little bit long, but I don't want to keep a bunch of people packed or uh, over time. We'll try and get this thing done. Um, any other thing? What else, do I, what else do I need to talk about here? Anything else? Leif, you got anything else to say about the Academy? Yeah, we're, we're just, we just launched on a new uh, learning management system for our Extreme Ownership Academy. So anybody that wants to, wants to check that out, um, could go to extremeownership.com um, and uh, or go to academy.echelonfront.com. Uh, either of those landing pages uh, are, are should be live and working. And we've got a bunch of free training that's available there now, too, if you want to just check out what that is. Um, if you want to dive a little deeper into uh, the barriers of extreme ownership, that's Jamie, Jamie and, and Jocko's course there that's awesome, or Dave and Jocko that have a... Uh, a great look into uh, into the framework for extreme ownership, how you actually take that uh, extreme ownership at a tactical level and the actual steps to follow and what to say and also what not to say in there as well, uh, too. It's uh, It answers a lot of these questions there, too. So all you got to do is go and sign up with your email and all the, there's uh, uh, that free content available for you to dive into it. Uh, and if you want to be a part of Extreme Ownership Academy, you can join these live sessions that we do once a week uh, where we get to answer questions and follow up with some uh, some sit reps or situation reports, which is an update um, where we can uh, we can actually help you solve problems with leadership. At the end of the day, all of your problems are leadership problems, and leadership is the solution. And I hope that uh, we'll see you guys there on Extreme Ownership Academy. Awesome. Yeah, it's it's really it's really just kind of a crazy thing when you start to apply these principles. You're you're gonna see. And, and I know Leif's been uh, running a little podcast lately called This Stuff Works. When you start to apply these principles in your business, in your life, you're going to see that these things actually work. They're not always easy, but they actually work. And all of that starts when you start saying, hey, all my problems are leadership problems and I'm the leader. Therefore, I'm creating these problems. What do I need to do to solve them? That's what we talk about. That's what we do. These things work wherever you go. Everybody listening, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. We hope to see you online. We hope to see you out there in the world, troopers in the wild. We appreciate the support. We appreciate talking to you. We appreciate your feedback. Now go out there and lead. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Roger that, out. Thank Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jocko. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for joining Thank us. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Jocko. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Randy. Thank Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Jocko. Yeah, thanks, Jack Crocker. Right on. Thanks, Jocko. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Mike B., John Moyer, thank you. Thanks, Jocko. Oh, recording. Lots of thank yous going down. Just wrapped up the, an awesome live session with a thousand troopers from all over the world. And I know there were hundreds 
uh, on YouTube and Facebook as well. Uh, people from all over the world. We had people on there from Europe and uh, New Zealand and Australia and Asia and the Middle East, uh, as well as all across America and, and, and Canada and, and South America. Um, really cool uh, group of people on there. They're, they're there to learn, willing to look at themselves and actually figure out what they can do to implement solutions to solve problems with leadership. Uh, that's what I love most about these, uh, these Academy Live sessions. And um, it's just awesome to see people that are, uh, that are leading and winning on their battlefield. Um, that's what's awesome about the Academy. And I uh, hope to see most of those folks there soon.